Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much, Lord, for, God, the opportunity to worship you today. We realize that you are high and lifted up and that you are holy and righteous and just and full of love and grace and grace and mercy and truth. And, uh, Lord, we're thankful that you are our God, our creator, and how humbling it is to know that we have access into your presence. And we realize that this is only true because of what Christ has done on our behalf. And so we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his death, burial, and resurrection. We thank you for the person of the Holy Spirit, our comforter. And we pray that you would be honored during this time of the preaching of your word. May all things be done for your glory, be said for your glory. And may you use the preacher this morning for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. I'd like to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is where we will be today. If you're visiting with us today, I started a series some time back entitled Troubled and Triumphant out of 1 Corinthians. And uh, 1 Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth, and it was a troubled church. And Paul wants them to know that in the midst of their trouble, they can be triumphant if they'll start living for the Lord the way they're supposed to. The trouble that they're facing is not outward persecution. The trouble that they're facing is inward turmoil uh, because the church is being unholy. The believers in the church are choosing sin over righteousness. And so Paul is going to deal with that this morning in this passage of Scripture. And so if you're there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start reading in verse 1. Again, this is why I love preaching through books of the Bible. Okay, let me tell you that. When you come to this church, we're going to preach expository messages through books of the Bible. Why? Because it forces the preacher to preach passages that he normally wouldn't preach on. For example, you probably would not want to be in my spot this morning. Because I'm going to be preaching a very difficult topic. And there's a tendency... If you don't preach through books of the Bible, there's a tendency for a pastor to sit in his office and say, what do I think I'll preach today? Uh, I don't want anybody mad at me, so I'm not going to preach that. I know some people in the church who are dealing with that, so I'm not going to preach that because they'll think I'm talking about them. So I'll, I'll pick something that just makes everybody feel good, right? And there's a lot of that going on today. But when you preach through books of the Bible, you are, and it's a good, it's a good thing I'm about to say, you are forced to deal with passages that perhaps you normally wouldn't deal with just by human nature. And so we come this morning uh, to one of those difficult passages, and uh, I'm going to preach it. And I've asked the Lord to help me to preach it this morning in grace, but also in truth. I've asked the Lord to give me courage to say what the Bible says and not to, not to sway from that. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, let's read. Paul says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and the kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who, who, let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing when you are assembled in the name of the lord jesus and my spirit is present with the power of the lord jesus you are to deliver this man to satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the lord your boasting is not good do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and the swindlers and the idolaters, since then, you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed 
or as an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Those are pretty stout words, wouldn't you agree? And uh, I get the great opportunity of preaching that this morning. So, most of you know that right out of high school, I worked on an offshore drilling rig. And then after working on an offshore drilling rig, I went to, the, I went to work, work for the railroad. And you may be thinking, what in the world could a railroad and an offshore drilling rig have in common? Well, a lot of things, but one thing in particular. Are you ready for it? One little, one little word, R-U-S-T, rust. Whether you work offshore or whether you work on the railroad, you're going to find rust somewhere. As a matter of fact, we were always battling rust on that offshore drilling rig. There were a crew of roustabouts, and their sole responsibility was to chip away at rust, put primer down, and put new paint. Why? Because it was not a good thing if you allowed metal to rust out there in the oil field. Somebody could get hurt. Also on the railroad, when I was working as a brakeman, that meant you had to get off the train and you had to connect cars together, and the engineer would be coming by at a certain rate of speed, not very fast, and you would have to jump on to that locomotive as it was coming by. Now, there's a certain way you have to do that. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to show it to you, but there's a certain way you have to get on so you don't hurt yourself. But all the time they had those locomotives in the shop and they were chipping away at rust, specifically on the handrails and on the steps. Why? Because if you, allowed it, if you allowed the rust to remain, it would corrode the metal and then it eventually it would break and, it, and someone could get hurt. Well, in his book, literally entitled Rust, The Longest War. <laughs> Jonathan Waldman takes us chapter by chapter into a world of oxidation. <laughs> he tells the story of how America almost lost the Statue of Liberty as a result of rust. It's a constant struggle going on in America. Corrosion everywhere. They're constantly having to battle rust concerning, concerning oil uh, pipelines, it's because of rust that we saw the development of stainless steel, rust-resistant paint, and how aluminum cans are treated to deter oxidation and the enormous costs that come along with that. Rust just isn't annoying, it's expensive, and it's, and it's destructive. It just so happens that rust can't be stopped. On August 1, 2007, a bridge spanning the Mississippi River in Minnesota suddenly collapsed during the evening rush hour. The bridge identified as Bridge 9340 in official records was, great, was rated as the second busiest bridge in the entire state, with 140,000 vehicles crossing it every day. One day, the bridge collapsed. 111 vehicles fell to the surface. 13 people were killed, 145 injured. Now, what was the main cause of this collapse? You probably figured it out by now. Rust. You say, Pastor, why are you talking so much about rust? Because I want to I use rust as a metaphor to really what I want to talk about today, and that's the issue of sin. You see, rust and sin have a lot in common. Rust is expensive. Rust will cost something. Rust is destructive. Rust must be dealt with. I say to you, dear church, is it not the same way with sin? Sin will cost you something. Sin must be dealt with. Sin is destructive. And that's the very thing that Paul addresses in this chapter. He, address, he addresses the issue of sin in the church. 
And so I want to make sure that you understand the context of this verse. He is talking about sin in the church. He's not talking about sin in Walmart or sin at your job or sin in your school or sin wherever it may be. He's talking about sin in the church. And so it's important that we understand that so that we'll get the true meaning of what he's saying here. I'm going to talk to you about two specific areas of sin that must be dealt with. First, I'm going to talk about how sin must be dealt with corporately as a body of believers. Second, I'm going to talk about how sin must be dealt with personally. Now, who am I talking to? Am I talking to the lost this morning? Am I talking to the unchurched? Not primarily. Why? Because the object of Paul's attention in this chapter are Christians, the church. So we're going to be talking to Christians about dealing with sin corporately and dealing with sin personally. You may be thinking, why does it take Paul five chapters to, uh, uh, to eventually deal with this serious issue? Should he not have dealt with this issue from the very beginning? Well, in the first four chapters of Corinthians, Paul laid down some theological groundwork. He wanted them to understand the importance of the gospel. He wanted to, he wanted to reprimand them for their divisive pride. Also, he wanted to remind them of who they are in Christ. So now that he's laid down this theological foundation, pointing them once again back to the gospel, he is now going to address this sin issue in the church. And make no mistake about it, his goal is to invoke shame in them. He wants them to feel shame for what they're allowing to happen in the church. Well, as we look at our passage, Paul says, it is actually reported, he says. It is actually reported there in verse 1 that there is sexual immorality among you. By the way, that word sex, sexual immorality is one word in the Greek language. It's the word porneia. That's the word. It's where we get our English word pornography from. Pornography doesn't, normally we limit it to just looking at magazines or certain things on the internet. But really, porneia encompasses all sexual sin. All sexual sin. It can be fornication, which is sin outside of marriage, or sex outside of marriage. It could be adultery. It could be homosexuality or lesbianism. It could be pornography but that word encompasses all different shades of sexual immorality so primarily he's going to deal with incest this morning which totally blows our mind how in the world could they be allowing incest in the church and by the way this is a sin that was known to everyone it's very important that you that you know this from the very beginning we're not talking about sins that a Christian commits and then they're convicted by it and they repent. You understand? We're not talking about events, sin events in someone's life. We all know people who are believers who have gotten away from the Lord and who have sinned and they've repented as the Spirit of God convicted them. What this passage of Scripture is talking about is believers or people who say they're believers who are living in known sin, and it's known throughout the congregation. And the congregation says nothing or does nothing about it. That is the context of what we're dealing with this morning in this passage of Scripture. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about this incest, but before we do, I want to focus on that word actually in verse 1. That word actually, and it may be translated differently in your Bible, but in the Greek, it's the word holos. Holos. And it signifies a surprise. So here, here's what we see in this passage. Paul is absolutely surprised by what he has heard. It has been reported to him that there is a situation in the church. He doesn't say the person's name. He says, there is a situation in the church 
where a man is sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul says, this, I can't believe, literally, I can't believe this is happening. Not only can I believe, only can I not believe this is happening, I cannot believe that you're tolerating it. I, can't, I cannot believe that you're acting as if it's no big deal. So what you're going to see here is Paul is going to challenge the church to deal with this sin corporately because everyone knows about it. So he says there, look, it is actually reported that there is porneia, that there is sexual immorality among you. Now, what does this sexual immorality look like? Well, he tells us specifically. What is it? Incest. Now, I don't believe that this is a... Uh, a young man sleeping with his biological mother. Okay, I don't think that's the issue. I think perhaps the father has remarried and the son is now having a relationship with his stepmom. That seems to be what the test, the, the passage suggests. He says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And look at what he says. And of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. He says the pagans don't even do what you're doing. The pagan world was saturated with sexual immorality. But they knew not to do that. And so why does Paul say that? Why does Paul say to the church, even the pagans know better? Because he is seeking to invoke shame in them. You're doing something that the lost world knows is wrong. Now, I don't know that we can say that too much today. Of course, if we hear of incest, we know that's wrong, and I believe the lost world even knows that's wrong. But what about all other types of sexual immorality? What about fornication, sex outside of marriage? What about um, uh, uh, adultery and homosexuality and those different sins? What about those? Well, we live in a culture today that, for the most part, finds those things as socially acceptable. Socially acceptable. As I was contemplating this sermon this week, I thought, man, have we slipped so far in moral downgrade that it's absolutely impossible to recover? Well, from man's perspective, perhaps. But we serve a God where all things are possible. And God can turn things around, and that's what we should pray for. We should seek God for spiritual awakening. But the reality is this, and I'm talking about in the church. For the most part, across our land, and I can speak of the American church specifically, sexual immorality, porneia, is something that is quite common and something that is tolerated when it's known about. It ought not be that way, brothers and sisters. In love, we ought to go to those who claim to be followers of Christ, and in love, we ought to seek to restore them to a true life through repentance. He says, you're tolerating this. You're tolerating something that even the world does not do. What is it? For a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Now, it doesn't mean that they're boasting about this sin. It's not like they're going into the community and saying, hey, man, check this out. We got this guy in our church, and, man, he's a cool dude. He's sleeping with his father's wife. They, they weren't doing that, but what were they doing? You'll recall in the first four chapters, these were very prideful people. They thought they should be honored. They thought they should be seated in the place of kings. They were very prideful. And Paul says, you are arrogant. Here you are in all of your pride, and you don't even have a reason to be prideful. As a matter of fact, you should feel shame. And instead of being prideful and tolerant of sin, you ought to mourn over sin. You ought to mourn over this situation. Let me ask you, Hey, are you being tolerant of sin? Church, are we being tolerant of sin? 
Are we in our pride choosing to ignore what we know is wrong? Are we choosing to close a blind eye? Paul says it ought not be that way. When sin is known about in your life, and when sin is known about in the life of church, of the church, the proper response is to do what? It's to mourn. We ought to mourn over sin. Why should we mourn over sin? Because that's the very reason that Christ went to the cross. Christ went to the cross to die for sin. Now how shall we live in sin? How shall we tolerate sin? But the reality is, well, I'm, before I deal with it personally, I still want to deal with it corporately. So let's talk about it corporately. Let's talk about sin, a sinning brother or sister in the church. And everybody knows about it. Paul gives four directives in this passage. Four directives to expel the person from among them. This is church discipline. You might refer to this as excommunication. You say, man, that's hard. What kind of church is this? Well, listen, all I can tell you is that we're a church that preaches the Bible. And uh, if you have your Bible with you, you'll see that what I'm preaching is, on the, is in the Scripture. I'm just taking it from the Scripture. I make no apologies about that. So look at these four directives. The first one is what I call very direct. You see that in verse 2. Look at what he says. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Look at what he says. Here's the directive. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Whose responsibility is this? Is it the sole responsibility of the pastor? No, he's talking to the congregation as a whole, isn't he? He says, let this person be removed from among you. Now again, is this the first response? No, we follow what the Lord tells us in the book of Matthew. You go to that person. You call them to repentance. If they're unwilling to repent, what do you do? You take someone with you. If they're unwilling to listen, what do you do? You take it before the church. If they're still unwilling to listen, then what do you do? Then you do this. There's steps that we are to take before we ever get to this point. But after we've taken those steps in order to redeem a brother or sister, and they are still unrepentant, what does he say? Let that person be removed from among you. Verse 5. Another directive. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Now how in the world could Paul say that? How in the world could Paul say, deliver such a person over to Satan? Well, there's many different ideas about what that means, but if we truly look at all of Paul's writings, we understand this. The reality of isolation makes the possibility of repentance. The reality of isolation makes repentance a possibility. They're not going to repent as long as the sin's tolerated. They're not going to repent as long as it's seen as customary. As long as it's seen acceptable. They're not going to repent. But what he is saying here is that when you remove such an unrepentant person from the church, you are moving them out from the protection and the strength of the body. And so when he says you are handing them over to Satan, he is not saying that their soul is going to be damned forever. His point is, is because they are now out under protection, Satan is going to have the freedom to wreak havoc in their life. So in a sense, and it's quite ironic, Satan himself can become a delivering agent under the sovereign hand of God, of course. He says, hand such a one over. Who? Who is the such a one? It's a Christian or someone who claims to be a Christian but yet is living in sin. In this situation, it was incest. He says, hand that person over to Satan and excommunicate them, remove them from among you, and he says, so that Satan will have the freedom to wreak havoc in their life. That's pretty tough, isn't it? But what is the purpose of doing this? Is it to be mean? Is it to be judgmental? What is the purpose? Well, look at the passage. Look at the passage. Verse 5, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, not his soul, 
Not the destruction of his flow, his flesh. Right? A great example of this is Job. Now, Job was not in sin, but what did Satan do to Job? He attacked his flesh. Right? Same, same concept here. Hand them over. Satan to attack their flesh. Why? So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So the whole purpose of excommunication or church discipline or handing the person over to Satan, the whole purpose is not destruction or condemnation. The whole purpose is redemption. You remember the story of the prodigal son? The father let him go. He took his father's wealth. What did he do? He squandered it. Did the father go after him? No. He squandered it in loose living and wild living. And his life got so low that he ended up wanting to eat the, the, uh, uh, the slop of a pig. And this is a Jew. That's unheard of for a, a Jew to eat the slop of a pig. But what was the point? The Bible says when he was at his lowest point in life, what did he do? He came to his right mind and he repented. And he returned back to his father. And his father opened his arms and greeted him. Isn't that the purpose of what we're talking about here? You hand that person over. You purge them from among you so that Satan can wreak havoc in their life, so that he can wreak havoc against their flesh. Why? So that they might realize just how sinful they've been and come to repentance. Right? As long as the church continues to harbor such a person, as long as the church tolerates such a person that person is going to feel safe and secure under the umbrella of the church and they're not ever going to feel the need for repentance you understand what i'm saying this is tough love right this is tough love so that's the second directive so the first directives are what i call very direct and notice that grace is 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 actually the umbrella of all this Grace is saturating all this. The whole purpose of doing this is so that that person's soul might be saved. Grace is here. It may seem harsh. It may seem tough. But the purpose is, is redemption. The purpose is for the salvation and the deliverance of that person's soul. This is couched in grace, my friend. Do not miss it. The second directive is metaphorical. Verse 7. He says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are a new or as you are unleavened he says to the church you are unleavened bread so start living like that now let's talk about the context of this verse we know that during the passover when the nation of israel was being brought out of egypt you remember uh, moses went into pharaoh and he said let my people go and the lord said that he was going to send a death angel and every house that did not have the blood applied to the door would exp the, the firstborn in that home would die whether of human or livestock and the Lord told them for a week they were to remove leaven from their house now we know what leaven does what does leaven do in bread it puffs it up that's what it does when you put leaven in dough or bread it puffs it up the Lord says symbolically leaven represents sin it puffs up. So for a week, clean all the leaven out of your home. Because that's going to symbolize your deliverance from evil. And then when you observe the Passover meal, you are to eat unleavened bread. And when you've cleaned out the leaven, and you're eating unleavened bread, when, when you have the unleavened bread, now you're prepared to celebrate the Passover. And the Lord is saying the same thing. The Lord is saying that Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. If you are saved, you are unleavened bread. So clean out the leaven and start living like it. Clean out the sin so that you can start living the way God wants you to live. Church, there is a time if we encounter someone who is living in known sin, and if we take the steps to restore them, if we take the steps to go to them and to bring them to repentance, and they still refuse to repent, they still choose to remain in their sin, then there does come a time where that person has to be handed over, where that person has to be, the church has to clean out that sinful person. 
Why? So that their soul may be saved. So that they may realize what they have done and repent. And therefore experience the grace of Almighty God. He also says here, he says, Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What's he saying here? He's not saying, well, let's celebrate the Passover meal. Why? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover. So what is he saying here? He's saying the, the celebration represents the abundant life. The only way you're going to be, listen to me, dear Christian, the only way we as a church will experience the abundant life is if we clean out the leaven. Now, we're not talking about private sins that people commit. We're talking about known sins. That is being, uh, sin that is being uh, uh, snubbed in the face of God. He says, we're to deal with that. So the removal of yeast represents the deliverance of evil. The removal of sin in the church opens us to the abundant life. The third directive is scriptural, and it comes there from verse, uh, last part of verse 13. Purge the evil person from among you. Purge the evil person from among you. That's actually a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 3, 13 verse 5. So now he's quoting scripture. He's using Old Testament scripture to prove a New Testament point. In the Old Testament, it was referring to false teachers. If you find a false prophet or a false teacher in your midst, you're to purge that person. And so notice that the scripture places uh, a sinful brother or sister who is unrepentant on the same level as a false teacher. If you allow the false teacher to remain, he's going to contaminate the whole body. And that's the whole point here. If you allow the unrepentant brother or sister to remain, it's going to contaminate, contaminate the whole. One person's sin that the church is tolerant of can bring God's judgment upon the whole. Did you hear what I just said? If the church is tolerant of open, unrepentant sin, such in this situation of incest, he says that that's happening, and you go to that brother or sister, and they don't repent, then you need to take these steps. You go to them privately at first, and if they don't repent, then you take these steps. Or perhaps it's uh, adultery. Maybe you know of someone in the church, and this guy is sleeping with that guy's wife, and this, or vice versa, and, and those type of things happen. He says if that's happening, uh, you go to them individually, you call them to repentance. If they don't repent, you take others with you. If they don't repent, then listen. You bring it before the church, and if they're unrepentant, you purge the people from you. The scripture actually says those who are unrepentant in this situation, the scripture actually says they're evil people. So here's what I want to say. He says, purge the evil person from among you. So even though they may claim to be Christians, if they choose their sin over Jesus, are they really? How do we know that someone is truly born again? How do we know whether or not someone is truly saved? Is it not through a repentant lifestyle? It's our repentance that proves the genuineness of our conversion. Our faith and our repentance that proves the genuine of our, uh, genuineness of our conversion. You say you have faith in Jesus, but there's no repentance. Is there truly faith in Jesus? Because if one has faith, one too will have repentance. And I'm not saying that repentance is going to be easy. I understand that it may be difficult. I understand that you may be in a life situation right now. Perhaps you're living together outside of marriage. I understand that that can be tough. Maybe you've been living together for some time and your bills are together. And, and maybe you've even had children together. Well, let me just say to you this. If that's the situation that you're in and you know it's wrong and you want help, come talk to me about it. I'm not going to bring you before the church. We're not, we're not to that step yet. You understand? <laughs> that's on down the road. You come talk to me about it. We'll, I'll, I, we will do everything that we can to help you make that situation, situation right. But what you need to do is get married. Stop living in sin. Get married. And start living the way you're supposed to. Okay? Young people, morality is shams today. 
But let me tell you, sex outside of marriage is sin against God. I don't care what culture tells you, what people say. What that means is that you're not to live together until you have been married. Well, we live together, but we don't... I'm not stupid, and neither is God, okay? You understand that Paul regards the community, the church, as no less guilty than the person who commits the sin? If you know it and you tolerate it, you're no less guilty than the person that's doing it. That's what he says to the church. Why is Paul so adamant? And not just adamant, he's even forceful at times. Why? Three reasons. First reason, because it's a poor witness to the community. When a church allows that to happen, it's a poor witness. Notice what he said there. Even the pagans know not to do that. It's a poor witness to the community when the church has known sin and it's unwilling to deal with it. Number two, it contaminates the whole body. Remember what he said about leaven? If you allow it to remain, you know it, you tolerate it, you say nothing about it, it will work like leaven does bread. It will eventually do what? It will contaminate the whole congregation. It will puff up the whole congregation. And as a result, it will invoke God's judgment upon that congregation. So it must be dealt with. It must be dealt with in love. But it also must be dealt with in truth as well. I pray that you understand that. I, I hope that somehow, in some way, I'm, that, that this message is coming across in truth and love. And not mean-spirited at all. Because the whole purpose of me preaching this message is for the redemption of those who are in sin. Understanding that there's no sin that Blake Gideon can't commit. I am prone to sin just like everybody else, and that's why I have to be on guard. Thirdly, he's so adamant, even forceful. Why? Because it stifles spiritual growth. He says there, clean out the whole leaven, verse 7. Why? Last part of verse 8. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of what? Sincerity and truth. You cannot be a church of sincerity and truth. You cannot be a person of sincerity and truth. You cannot grow spiritually if you tolerate sin. So three reasons he deals with it. Because it's a poor witness, because it will contaminate the whole body, and because it will stunt and stifle your spiritual growth. You will not be able to live the abundant life. And that's what God wants for you. That's what brings him glory. But not only should sin be dealt with corporately, as we see in this passage, sin should also be dealt with personally. Personally. Now this is where it comes to you and to me. Do you? We talked about sin in the church, and we've got to look at that. We've got to evaluate that. You say, Pastor, has this church ever dealt with sin like that? In my four and a half years that I've been here, I know that we've done, dealt with it twice. You say, well, we didn't know about it. That's because we did it, that we, because we, we, we did it the right way. All right? We dealt with it twice. I don't think necessarily bringing it before the whole church, bringing it before the whole church, means that you bring them up here on Sunday morning and talk about it. I think you bring it before the leaders of the church, the pastoral leadership, the deacons. You bring it before the leaders in the church. Because some of you couldn't deal with it. You'd run out and gossip about everybody's dirty laundry. So you bring it before the leaders in the church, the pastors and deacons. Those were the officers of the church. And you deal with it in that setting. In the four and a half years I've been here, we've dealt with it twice. Both times, the people, the individual was unrepentant. And they're no longer a member of this church. Not because we don't love them. Not because we don't want them here. It's because they were unwilling to repent. And we wanted to be faithful to Scripture. I hope I never have to deal with it again. To be honest with you, I hope I never have to deal with it. But we've dealt with that. But what about your life personally? Are you allowing your heart to be a safe harbor for sin? Have you allowed sin to drop its anchor? in your heart, in your life. 
Are you being tolerant of sin in your life personally? Oh, dear Christian, it ought not be that way. I'm not saying that we're not going to have daily struggles. I'm not saying that we won't even fight against sin. We will. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you have sin in your life, and it has become a part of your lifestyle. It's become a part of your everyday or even weekly habits. Um, we're the masters at justification. We're the masters. We call sin a lot of things, don't we? We call sin an accident. God calls it an abomination. We call sin a blunder. I just had a blunder. God calls it blindness. Man calls it, well, it just happened. It was like by chance. God calls it a choice. Lewis Sperry Schaefer once said, It may be a secret sin on earth, but it's a scandal in heaven. John Owen said, Do you mortify sin? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it as long as you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. We must purge out the old leaven of the old life if we're going to be able to live the abundant life now. I have good news for you. I have good news. There's mercy with God. There's mercy with God. In Isaiah 1, 18 and 20, and I'm, and I'm getting to the end of this message, so hang with me. He says, Come, now let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, crimson they shall be like wool. If. See, we, we always like to quote that first part, don't we? If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What's he saying here? Oh, if you come to the Lord with a repentant heart, there's blessing. There's blessing in repentance. There's blessing in confession. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, what? He is faithful and just to cleanse. Oh, there's hope for the hurting heart this morning. Some of you are in sin and your heart hurts. You're mourning over it. And perhaps God has convicted you and the shame has set in. But I want you to know that your shame can be turned to rejoicing if you are faithful in your confession and your repentance. Listen to me. God is not against you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you're doing right now. Listen to me. Don't let the devil lie to you. God is not against you, but he is against your sin. The question is, are you with God against your sin or not? Are you with God against your sin? When indwelling sin becomes a burden to you, only then will Christ become your delight. If you're not delighting in Christ now, it could be because you're harboring sin. Proverbs 28, 13. He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. There's mercy with God this morning, and there's blessing in confession. So what is the application? That you would allow God to search your heart and reveal to you any sin that you may be harboring. And that this morning, that you would seek His face and His grace for repentance as you make confession. You don't need a priest. You go to the Lord and repentance, and faith, and confession. And there, my friend, you will experience the mercy, and the blessing, and the cleansing of God that is ours through Jesus Christ. Let us pray.
I said to you at the beginning of this sermon that sin is like a rust that's going to corrode, it's going to destroy. If it's not dealt with, it will destroy whatever it touches. It's like a cancer. Let me ask you this morning. Are you tolerating sin in your life? Do you have sexual immorality in your life? Do you have bitterness or covetousness or unforgiveness? Listen, he doesn't just talk about sexual immorality in this passage. He talks about greed. Not just the sexually immoral person, but the greedy. The idolater. The reviler. The drunkard. Swindler. Not just the sexual immoral. What's he talking about? He's saying, listen. Anyone who claims to be a brother or sister in Christ, and they are living in unrepentant sin, And you know about it. It must not be allowed to continue without a graceful, loving confrontation. The reality is that the Holy Spirit is confronting some of you this morning. How will you respond? Will you respond in confession and repentance? It's more than just saying, it's doing. I make myself available for you. I don't know your situation. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're struggling with. But I will, if I can, by God's power, I will move hell and and high water to do everything that I can to help you. Help you make your wrong situations in life right. You understand? You may not like what you hear, but it'll be for your good. You come to me. And I know I speak on behalf of our other pastors as well, and even our deacons. Perhaps you need to be saved. Perhaps you've never truly given your life to the Lord. And this morning, during this invitation, I'm going to ask for everybody to stand. For those of you who need salvation, for those of you who just want to come to the altar and do business with God, that'll be your time to come. Holy Father, we we give this to you now. And we pray, God, for your people to respond to the gospel, to truly believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and to surrender their lives to him as their personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and begin to come now as the Lord leads you come?